fear, you know, of taking a chance on technology and the risks associated with that and often lead to over-engineering a compliance or regulatory solution that just hurts industry and, and, you know, the world at large. And I think that sometimes we need to engage public early and often as a solution and really debunk some of these building myths and perceptions and really put into perspective real risks and how do we kind of overcome and, and collectively work towards not stifling the innovation, uh, but really thinking about good, strong policy and compliance and you know how to uh, enforce that in a way that uh, allows the innovation to be done safely. Good. Last question before we go to audience, and, and you don't, you're not obligated to answer this one, I just want to offer it to everyone. Um, give your best advice to state and local government leaders out there. What should they do to better prepare their localities for the types of technology advances that your sector can bring to transportation? Because they struggled with that every day. What, what can they do today to really help? Yeah, so I think today, uh, one of the places I would say is that, look, we, we, we want you to engage with us, but the understanding that none of us has uh, any of the answers at this point. And we need to figure out you know, the ways that we can work together uh, to explore and figure out what the, what the right answers are. And, um, and we, will, we will reach out and, and engage with you. Uh, and we look forward to that. I think the second piece is what Gladdy mentioned right at the end. I think public acceptance is going to be incredibly important uh, to these uh, new technologies. And um, you know, there is a lot of uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, in the public. If you look at the polling numbers on self-driving vehicles, which you in this room said was the most uh, impa impacting right. trend, um, it, but you look at the public acceptance numbers uh, in the polls and it's uh, anywhere from two-thirds to three-quarters of the people are saying that they would never get into a, a self-driving uh, vehicle. Um, so uh, they, the uh, people in your jurisdiction look to you as uh, someone that's knowledgeable in transportation, that's knowledgeable about uh, what's going on, and um, you know, if you can help us uh, engage with the public and uh, convince them that these uh, innovations are going to have an incredible impact on their quality of life and uh, the safety of, of their family and loved ones. Um, and it's going to be a much better world uh, instead of one that uh, sometimes gets portrayed in a very dystopian fashion. Uh, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll extend on what I said earlier and, and a little bit of this is we, we can't, we can't, we, we shouldn't over engineer everything to make it perfect for every human being in the future, right? And so if we, if we know that, we have to think long term. I understand all of you that are in this space have to think long term and we have to think broad. But in order to get there, we need to start looking at the near term. What can we do literally today? So with our microtransit service, these are wheels on the ground in a matter of months, serving people. Those people you saw in that video, those are real, real people. Those are riders that are getting benefit in a matter, I think it was two months from the time we signed a contract to the time they had wheels on the ground serving those people. What can you do today, even if it's a low risk, small experiment to start making progress towards the new world and serving your community better? So while you think about the long term and protect the long term, think today and start doing some experimenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that you know at, at 3M we we put a premium on collaboration, and it's really going to take um, all stakeholders involved to to get together and and start uh, you know figuring out how, how this new model of transportation is going to work. Uh, you know, transportation engineers and planners have been doing things uh, the same way for a very long time, and that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. That's how it's evolved. But but with new automated vehicle technologies, we're we're starting to see a, a paradigm shift here, 
And in order for the, the transportation community to, to evolve, I think we need more uh, research and development and, and pilot projects where uh, we, can, we can work with these new transportation innovators to understand uh, what it's gonna take from a, a public sector standpoint uh, to, to ensure that these, uh, the benefits of these technologies can be uh, realized. Um, you know, at the same time, there, this technology is so new that uh, it's you know, hard to keep up with um, you know, what's, uh, what's changing out there and, and what types of technologies are being used in these vehicles. So it's important for us to, to kind of get together and, and keep proprietary information um, uh, you know, proprietary but at the same time, uh, educating our transportation uh, uh, stakeholders about you know, what, what needs to get done to, to help these vehicles get on the road safely. Yeah. And, and just continuing to, to remind your stakeholders, um, who are our shared stakeholders, what the, what the goals are, you know, that we share these same goals. We want people to get around. That's why we built this public infrastructure in the first place. Yeah. We want to use it. We want to increase the number of trips, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't lead to all sorts of negative outcomes that give a lot of people headaches and make them upset with all of us. So, yeah. uh, so I think that's a really important leadership role too that government can play is, hey, we built these roads, we built these rails, uh, we're creating this space in, in the sky, you know, uh, this new access to get more goods and services and people around more easily. And that, would, that helps serve as an invitation too to the private sector to say, hey, we're, we're, we're open, we want to see you come in and compete with each other to come up with the best solutions to help us to get to that, to that shared future. Ditto to everything that's been said about collaboration and uh, altering the procurement pathways and you know, doing demonstration or pilot projects. And the, but the one thing I would add is um, it's nice to you know, kind of corral and talk about these ideas such as we are today. Uh, I think you see five uh, industry partners that are willing and able and committed to support the cause. I think what truly defines and sets the stage is when we wake up tomorrow, what are we gonna do differently to help accelerate or commit to this pathway of technology, innovation, adoption, and embracing it and trying it, maybe failing sometimes as Doug pointed out, but learning from it, you know, so fail fast and what are you gonna do differently? And so uh, what I would impress is uh, how can you continue to be a champion for technology and to seek these and cultivate pathways, you know, to embrace this technology um, from procurements to non-traditional pathways to uh, creating a dialogue and, uh, and an exchange uh, ongoing and, uh, you know, in a, in a very transparent manner because I think it's that ongoing frequent engagement is what it's gonna take to truly continue to evaluate where we can push this to and what makes sense. Great. Any questions from the audience? There's one down front and we have several in the back after cover. Microphone, here we go. Thank you. In uh, thinking about autonomous vehicles, do you think that the industry will agree upon and settle upon a single standard as to how the vehicle will read the road? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. Um, I think part of the answer is uh, we all have to be patient and, and, and see. I think that uh, the industry has proven that it will standardize. It is too, uh, it just makes too much sense not to uh, for all of the cost and efficiency and scale reasons. Uh, it, but uh, we are at the very beginning of, of this technology and uh, right now uh, there isn't standardization and there, there won't be for a while. It, you know, it takes a, an incredibly long time for uh, uh, NHTSA to uh, adopt an FMVSS uh, in the United States, and, and frankly, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, but I think the first thing that is going to we're going to see is that everybody will have different answers, different solutions, different innovations uh, to tackle these things, and uh, and we'll have to see you know which ones are the best. I think eventually uh, there will be some standardization. I think. One thing, though, I think it, it could be 
very different from, from what we have today. So for example, if, you're, you know, if you want to design an FMVSS that tests for uh, the roof crush, it's a pretty simple mechanical proposition. You figure out how strong the roof has to be before, uh, so it can withstand a, a crash and protect the occupants inside and you say it has to crush at a certain amount of pressure and you develop a test to do that. But with these uh, systems, they're built on artificial intelligence. Uh, the way that the vehicle works is it actually learns as, as it goes, it gets better. And so, you know, the vehicle that you test today is not the same vehicle tomorrow after it's driven on, on the road uh, after that. So, you know, we're going to have to figure out uh, better ways to develop uh, the regulations to deal with these new technologies as well. My question is related to risk management, and is there a direct correlation between these and safety enhanced features and reduced uh, liability costs for agencies and consumers? Yeah. So, what was the question in terms of? It was. Um, Correct me, I believe it was uh, between risk. Is there a correlation between the features that these technologies will bring and improved safety? And that's really a multi-sector question. So reduced I'm, liability costs. And reduced liability costs. Yeah, so I think uh, as we're able to uh, approach the safety uh, part of the, the question, uh, and I think everybody up here said that Making our roads safer is our top priority. Uh, I think uh, it's, uh, we pointed to the fact that we're losing 37,000 lives uh, roughly every year on the roads and, and on our uh, streets and highways. Uh, is, a, is a tragedy and, and frankly I think to some extent the American public are, are like the frogs in the boiling water um, and uh, They've just learned to accept that as the cost that we're all paying to for our mobility. Uh, but you know, as we're able to uh, create safer roads uh, through these technologies, uh, the cost uh, of that will drop uh, tremendously. The impacts on our society in terms of productivity, all these other things that are, are really uh, yeah, are going to be transformative. Yes. Question in the context of safety and education, and I'll offer the premise that George Jetson probably didn't have a driver's license to hop in his uh, his vehicle. So, for ki for us that have kids that are maybe six to ten years old now, what does a driver's license certification look like for them in ten years? And then maybe for a lot of people in the room that have had a license for thirty or forty years, should there be some discussion going on now about? recertification to drive one of these smart vehicles if they really don't maybe understand how it works. Is that being talked about at all? Yeah, so I think it's um, incumbent on uh, the folks that are implementing these technologies to figure out you know, the right ways to do them so that the public uh, accepts them. Uh, you know, our super cruise system, uh, ha we spent Probably the, the greatest amount of work that occurred on that system was on the, the human machine interface to figure out what is the right, most intuitive, easiest way for somebody to learn how to engage that system and what it means when the system is providing them with feedback to tell them it's time for you to take over the wheel and, and all of those things. And uh, you know, we're very pleased uh, that we were rated uh, by Consumer Reports as the most effective uh, system in doing that. But I think. We're, we're going to have to figure that out for, for all of these uh, systems. And I think that in terms of driver licenses, uh, I do think that uh, for a long time to come, uh, there will be human-driven vehicles on the road. So I think we'll all still be dealing with uh, the need for a driver's license at one point in time. So it is, it is interesting to, to look at some of these demographic trends that we're, yep. we're starting to see. And, and as people are moving into maybe more urban environments generally and, and you have a new generation um, growing up, the, the desire, the strong urge to run out and get your driver's license as soon as possible is not as strong as, as it used to be. And it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to, to witness kind of writ large across our society. 
as someone who's raising three sons, the strong urge to do anything <laughs> <laughs> has been the challenge. <laughs> necessarily. I don't think that has changed since our day. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I have. Here's one over here. Oh. Okay. This, not this question is for Doug. Doug, how do we make sure that procurement is part of the solution to needed changes? Hold it up. We couldn't hear, so you're going to have to repeat it. Hold it up closer. This question is for Doug. Doug, how do we make sure that procurement is part of the changes that are needed upcoming? I'm not sure I like that question. Do you have another one? <laughs> um, so I think procurement, I think procurement, like many other areas, needs to start thinking in different ways, right? I don't want to be as cliche as saying thinking out of the box, but what can procurement be in the future? How should procurement work? Instead of saying, where are we today and what little tweak can we make and stay on the same path, it's, what is the vision for procurement down the road? How should it, should it be? And then we can reverse engineer it. In the near term, I'll just give you a quick example. We deal with all the time, we'll get um, RFPs or contracts and they have all these FTA requirements and all these government requirements in them that have absolutely nothing to do with the service that we provide. None, nothing. As an example, we have all these clauses in there that well, you need to indemnify us in case a driver, because of your technology, um, a driver runs over somebody. It's like, well, these are not our drivers. Our technology has nothing, there's zero impact on us. But we have to go through this every single time and remove these things and there's a back and forth and it slows everything down. So I think in the immediate term, are there changes that procurement can make to provide a situation that is in line with the service that is being procured and the actual situation that they're in. So maybe just looking at things a little differently like that would help. And it's, it should be more of a partnership. Yeah. Can I add to that actually? Because <laughs> I'm pretty passionate about this uh, topic and area of interest. Um, I think even really thinking about how we do procurement and maybe moving to a model where there's more demonstrations of the, you know, of the uh, technology, uh, you know, and the, the value of it, right? Um, that maybe if we could even think about, well, what is the challenge? Before we provide a prescription of what we think we want, let's share and exchange what the challenge is and maybe even crowdsource and push the best technology solution forward, right? Regardless of what industry or company or partner is uh, providing that and how do we all fit into that equation so i'd love to see a challenge uh you know where maybe all of us collaborate right and insight and bring in brainstorm you know of, of what the solution might be and then think of the right procurement pathway based on that you know uh proposal effort so and and then i think also changing some of the metrics of how uh, proposals are even evaluated right if it's based on past performance and uh, legacy or traditional models, well, innovation's never going to have a leg up, you know, in that equation. And so how do you incentivize new approaches and techniques and new ways, disruptive ways, to look at an old problem through a new lens? I, I think that needs to uh, be thought of head on. I love that. It, would be, it yeah. would be great if one day procurement was viewed as the enabler and when something we get to a point where we say, oh, good, it's now moving into the procurement stage, this is excellent, as opposed to, well, everybody has agreed, we're all wanting to go, but now we gotta bring procurement in, and oh my God, that, it shouldn't be that way. Yeah. We should be able to do these things in a collaborative way that makes procurement a positive and an enabling yeah. force. Yeah. Yes. I think we're running out of time, so I'll go. just, you can applaud for that. I'll all make right. a quick comment, but, um, uh, we got all evening. Don't worry. <laughs> no, um, Secretary Trogdon um, alluded to this to an earlier question about um, local governments and, and cities. You know, in terms of incorporating these kinds of innovation into our um, strategic plans, which is something we all do as cities, because we're the level of government that's closest to the citizens. Whether it's reducing congestion, getting people to where they want to go. So my question is, let's take, for example, this region, Wake County. We have 13 cities, uh, Research Triangle. Uh, do you believe 
that we should be thinking about the approaching these kinds of innovations through a regional approach. Because it seems to me that that would make it easier rather than reinventing the wheel and then working with our Department of Transportation under Secretary Draga's leadership in terms of working with the DOT to make sure that you know we're, we're all on the same page with the kinds of things we should be looking at. Anyone want that? Well, uh, just let me, uh, I'll start. Um, so frankly, you know, I don't know enough about the region to say what makes sense for this particular region, but I can say that I think that um, in some places, you know, an, a regional approach may be the, the idea that makes the most sense, whereas in other places, uh, a, a locality, uh, even a part of a, a big, a large city instead of, you know, the entire uh, city uh, may be uh, something that makes uh, the most sense. Um, I love Gladys' suggestion on procurement. Uh, you know, the smart city challenge that uh, the department, the Federal Department of Transportation ran uh, several years ago, and I don't know if uh, Raleigh-Durham uh, made a proposal as part yeah. of that. Um, I think Charlotte did. Yeah. Um, but, you know, even beyond the fact that only a few cities were selected, uh, we are still interacting with many of cities who said, you know, look, we went through all this wonderful planning, we got uh, engaged with all you stakeholders out yeah. there, uh, so we didn't get the, the big federal grant, but we still want to figure out, you know, what, what are the parts of our plan that we could put in place now on our own? Uh, so, I mean, the value of the Smart City Challenge uh, goes well beyond, you know, what they're going to be able to establish with Columbus in terms of what works and what doesn't yeah. work. Uh, and it really was, I think, a transformational event for a lot of cities, a lot of areas. Um, those are the kind of things that I think uh, are really exciting. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, I, I think uh, regional approaches work really well in situations where perhaps on your own, uh, a city would just not be as visible, <laughs> you know, might be in a have-not situation as opposed to some of the haves in cities that get uh, often the attention or drive, you know, some of the, you know, the, the tech towards them. Uh, but I also think it provides an opportunity to collaborate and exchange and share ideas and standardize, if, if you're looking for standardization, you know, of being able to uh, really think about common challenges and points of interest and best practices um, without having to solely invest your resources into, uh, you know, evaluating that. And so, uh, you know, when you can start pooling some of those investment resources to take a chance on technology and cultivate and exchange, you know, what is learned from that, I, I think a regional approach makes a, a lot of sense. And I'll just add yeah. too, because if I can. Yes, really, please. Really quickly, but in our, so our, in our business, the reason Uber, one of the reasons that Uber really took off and became super successful was because you had a lot of places where for close to 100 years, you had regions where people travel across jurisdictional boundaries every day. Yeah. But the policy prescriptions that each one had arrived at to try to solve similar goals were all different. And as a result, you had the public actually being negatively impacted, and that created this, this void that we stepped into. And so kind of the history of our company originally is, is one where had there been a, 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 a regional approach to, in the first place to, to trying to solve a particular problem, we might never ever have existed. But your public policy decisions can have a really big impact on whether or not you can attract new technology uh, but it can kind of, it can almost go both ways, but you might be setting yourself up for future disruption if you, <laughs> if you really zero in and, and don't want to think a little bit more collaboratively and, uh, about where people are moving across boundaries. Yeah. Well, great panel. Thanks everyone for Harry, Doug, Dan, Nick, and Gladys' participation. Let's give them a round of applause. Please. All right, thank you everyone, and uh, let's thank our secretary and the panel again. Y'all did a great job. I'm the last person standing between you and a great reception, so I'm going to be brief. I just had a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming and attending. I think you'll agree we've had some great discussions today. The secretary and I were trying to hop in and out of several of the breakout sessions and the one regret was we couldn't be in four places at one time so tomorrow's going to be another great day 
Uh, we start with breakfast at 7.30 uh, down in the exhibit hall, and then the general session starts at 9. Uh, I hope that you will go to the reception and take that opportunity to talk to people about some things you heard today or some ideas you have. Our entire board will be down there, and so uh, Greer usually likes me to take my uh, name tag off when I come up on stage, but I told her it's a prop today because you can identify our board members. Most of them will be wearing you know, our name tag. So please introduce yourself, engage them. Most of our senior staff is here as well, so please go up and introduce yourself if you don't know someone. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to thank you all for attending, and uh, the reception is ready to go downstairs in the exhibit area, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.